Okay, so uh, today is um, the 27th of March, uh, 2022, and this uh, Miss Van der Rohe's birthday. So uh, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about him, and then I'll show his works. I mean about his biography. So he was born on the 27th of March, uh, 1886. He was uh, one year uh, older than uh, Le Corbusier and one uh, year younger than uh, his uh, mistress uh, and uh, collaborator and partner, Lily Reich, uh, a woman, a very creative and interesting woman who uh, was his partner, professional and otherwise for 13 years. And apparently some of the pieces of furniture that uh, Miss van der Rohe so-called designed, in fact, were rather designed by Lily Reich. Apparently, she also had a, uh, an input uh, on the Barcelona Pavilion. I will show a few, I will say a few things about her when the time will come. So Ludwig, Ludwig Miss van der Rohe, uh, as you can see, he, he changed his name from Maria Ludwig Michael Miss to Ludwig Miss van der Rohe. And it's kind of funny because, you know, he was not a nobleman. He was not an aristocrat, but he wanted his name to sound, uh, you know, uh, to have uh, the sound of nobility. So he would have liked to have his name Miss de Rohe, Rohe being the, the name of his mother. But the German uh, law didn't allow him to do so. So then he employed the Dutch version van der Rohe. So that's how he arrived at Lud Ludwig Miss van der Rohe. But what is very strange, and I commented on this, is that he wanted, uh, you know, uh, his name to evoke, uh, you know, a uh, sense of nobility, of aristocracy, but he kept the name Miss, which means lousy in German. So I thought that this was uh, rather amusing and self-derogatory. Anyway, he was a German-American architect. And in this sense, uh, I think Wikipedia is right. He was commonly referred to as Miss, his surname, along with Alvar Aalto, Le Corbusier, Walter Gropius, and Frank Lloyd Wright. He is regarded as one of the pioneers of moder modernist architecture. In the 1930s, Miss was the last director, well, from 1930 to 1933, he was the last director of the Bauhaus, a groundbreaking school of modern art, design, and architecture after Nazis' rise to power with its strong opposition to modernism, leading to the closing of the Bauhaus itself, Miss emigrated to the United States. He accepted the position to head the architecture school at the Armour Institute of Technology, later the Illinois Institute of Technology in Chicago. I lived in Chicago for uh, around five years, and my impression was that uh, Miss destroyed Chicago. I know that many would protest uh, against my statement, but um, uh, with his seductiveness towards some kind of a European rationalism, uh, Miss Van der Rohe uh, made uh, Chicago forget its own heroes, meaning uh, to name just two, Louis Sullivan and Frank Lloyd Wright. Uh, here he was. Uh, without doubt, he was uh, an architect of uh, great, uh, great power and great intensity. And he was probably even handsome considering his success with women. Uh, he was also, he also drew very well. And I think he had correct ideas about architecture because his architecture, despite the fact that it appears to be very rational, uh, and in the Cartesian sense, I would say that it's uh, very close to being mystical, at least in his best works. I think he was a mystic of the right angle, uh, but differently than Le Corbusier, who dedicated a poem to the right angle uh, uh, and a straight line. Why do I say so? Well, I have some kind of a proof, and unfortunately, I don't have that book with me here with a little manifesto he wrote, where I think he understood that a great building is really about the immeasurable. And uh, being about the immeasurable, 
uh, we are very close to the indebtedness, indebted God. Forgive me. I wanted to say indelible. No, indelible. Yes, indelible. I, I was trying to make a, a word out of indelible, but I'm failing, so I better stop. Anyway, it's, it's literally about the um, immeasurableness or unmeasurableness. Um, okay, here he is uh, sculpted. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, kind of an interesting interpretation of how he was or looked like. Anyway, Ludwig Mies van der Rohe, the Bismarck Monument, we begin with very early works, those that are not generally known. Uh, and but but you see here the flirtation, if I am to call it so, with those in power, with Bismarck. He, you know, envisioned a monument for Bismarck. But Bismarck was himself, a, 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 I would say, an interesting politician, and uh, and uh, he's uh, the epitome of, uh, you know, uh, political power. But I think he was complex to Bismarck. But I, I'm not a, an expert in Bismarck, but I did have some interest at, at some point. I tried to understand a little bit about him. Anyway, this is the monument by, uh, this is the project by Miss van der Rohe for Bismarck. And it's almost Egyptian-like, no, in spirit. I mean, and, and, and uh, let's not uh, hesitate to tell the truth. It's something also, uh, you know, a little Nazi about it. Although he ran away from Nazis, but uh, you know, when you look at this architecture, you almost agree with Dan Hanganu, who said that a great architecture needs an autocratic client or figure. I'm not sure Dan Hanganu was right. Uh, we see what happens now with the war in Ukraine, where we have an autocratic uh, leadership in Moscow. And uh, because of that, every day people die. People who could have lived, they died. Um, anyway, this is the project for the monument for Bismarck um, that Miss van der Rohe did. I don't know in what year, the beginning of the 20th century, but I don't know exactly, maybe in the 20s, 1920s, I guess. He began, uh, he, 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 uh, he became a director of the Bauhaus in, in 1930. Uh, but uh, this project was done before. Drawing, some drawings by, uh, uh, by Miss. I think he drew very well, uh, poetically well, in my opinion. You know, they are very, they barely touched the, the paper with a pencil. Well, this is something else, it's, 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 it's the plan. Um, but his sketches, I, I like his sketches very much because his sketches, in my opinion, are, um, yes, I, I cannot avoid the word uh, poetical. Or this for the Barcelona Pavilion, you know, it shows uh, great sensitivity, actually. Uh, and that sense of, of the ineffable, the ineffable of art. Here in this collage, he placed a painting by his friend and former colleague. Uh, I don't know if they were friends, but they were colleagues at the Bauhaus, Paul Klee. In fact, I thought of writing an essay or something, Miss and Klee, because uh, in his apartment in Chicago, Miss van der Rohe had some small artworks by this great poet, but modest poet of painting that Paul Klee was. And here you see an example of his, uh, but uh, you know what is strange that this painting actually by Paul Klee is very small in dimensions. But um, Mies created this collage with it being, uh, you know, very large, enlarged, as you can see. Um, why did I want to write about Mies and Klee? Because I think, uh, the fact that in his apartment, he had just these exquisite small artworks by Paul Klee says something about, uh, about the unknown side of Mies. Because uh, Paul Klee was, was not in any way a, a rationalist. 
Uh, in fact, he was cultivating the dreamlike uh, qualities of painting. And, and the fact that Nice admired his uh, painting so much that he covered his walls in his apartment in Chicago with them um, says that he himself had a dreamy, dreamy nature. Now uh, that he was interested in art is obvious. Here we see Guernica by Picasso. You know, Guernica, of course, protesting against the war, the war which never, never stops on the lands of man. It's very, very sad. Um, yes, uh, you know, he, he knew how to do even watercolors, like we see here, sketches. Uh, he was a complex man, but, um, or here, you know, what does this Egyptian scribe doing here, you know, in this otherwise, uh, you know, modernistic Nisian uh, structure? I love this drawing. I, it's one of my preferred architectural drawings ever. Uh, it's for a skyscraper in Berlin. It was not built, but, um, you know, uh, Graphically, I think is is perfect. Is um, I very rarely use the word perfect, but in this case, I, I see I see no other words. The word that is uh, uh, appropriate. It was not built, and uh, but uh, you know it it shows a, a vision and it shows the the, the poetry of the of the architect Miss Van der Rohe and the poetry of the graphic artist, uh, Miss van der Rohe. And the plan, look at the plan, you know, the plan is not, he was also, he also worked with curves sometimes. So the typical Miss van der Rohe uh, was not always as typical. This was the plan of the tower that we just saw, uh, which again was not built. You see at the bottom here, maybe I have another illustration with this, another tower he proposed with the, with the periphery the, the, of, of the building quite free, you know, with the free curves and so on. So both towers show a different kind of mist that, than the one we are accustomed, were accustomed to. But on the, but on the other hand, you see that uh, uh, the architect, uh, even uh, at, its, uh, at his highest, so to speak, commits sometimes um, acts of, um, I don't know, should I just call it graphic vandalism or, uh, you know, betraying truth? I think he was searching for truth in his architecture, but what are we to make about this uh, illustration? which uh, came from his office, if not from his hand, where the trees are at least twice as tall as buildings which are four, four floors high. It's impossible. I never saw a, a tree which is 12, 15 floors high. So this is, uh, you know, a rendering, you know, a rendering which is uh, moving away from truth. <laughs> The, the trees are at a different scale than, than, than the buildings. Anyway, it's, um, this was done also by Le Corbusier, who was uh, doctoring photographs to, you know, to fit uh, uh, his uh, message, so to speak. You see the plan of that uh, skyscraper that he imagined, and uh, again, uh, you know, who would have thought that this is Miss? But even a great architect with great convictions has experimental periods in his or her life, you know, when tries various things. And this is one of the things that Miss tried but didn't uh, follow through. Some early works. The real house, a residential house in Potsdam, please be prepared for a surprise from 1908. Of course, he was young at that time. We remember he was born in 1886. So he was 22 years old. He didn't study architecture. <laughs> like, like many of the heroes of modernist architecture, Walter Gropius didn't either. 
I mean, they probably, but Gropius, I think his father was an architect. But in the case of Mies, no, his father was not an architect. In fact, he was um, a stone uh, worker. Um, this is what he built at 22. You know, nobody would think that this is a building by Mies, but it is. And it's not a bad building. Actually, you know, in some perverse way, perhaps I like it more than um, some of his uh, pristine uh, celestial um, abstractions. I, I, it's disputable what I said, but maybe not completely. You see, here he is. Uh, 22, not bad. You know, and uh, not studying architecture. You know, how, how did he build it? You know, I truly think. I truly think people can build, and it was proven, you know, countless times without going to any school of architecture, really. I mean, who taught architecture the incredible builders of the Dogon villages much better than Francis Kerr? Nobody. And they are not the only ones. So, Miss, a 22. Uh, 1911, a residential home. So, uh, this, uh, he was. Uh, Let's see, do I count well here, 14 plus now? Yeah, uh, 25 years old. Now this one is, you know, he, the man was uh, following the tradition of, of, of his place uh, in Germany, uh, you know, uh, I guess it's okay. Uh, is it bad? Is it good? I don't know, somewhere in between. But there is a, we already feel that here in this early work, when he was 19, 25 years old, there is already uh, something announcing what might come and did come. You know, a certain uh, rhythmicity, cleanness of uh, the composition is, is very clean. There are qualities here. It is not by uh, mistake that Gropius invited uh, me to do the Bauhaus and that he became a director. He made a name for himself building this kind of buildings and he built uh, a number of them. We are going to see some of them. But I think these early works of Miss van der Rohe are interesting, you know, and uh, Worth, worthy of attention. 1913, so he was 27 years old, Werner House. Um, this one is more nostalgic towards, uh, you know, the, the, the architectonic culture of Germany, uh, you know, in the 19th century, uh, maybe even before or early, the early years of the 20th century. I have seen buildings not very, very different, especially this kind of roofing in, uh, in Sibiu. Nineteen seventeen, so he was uh, thirty-one years old, growing old, <laughs> so to speak. Well, a bigger house, you know. He added some years to his life, but he got larger commissions. Very German, isn't it? I mean, I don't know if uh, he, something here that it's almost uh, it's almost almost a large gingerbread house. It's kind of um, I don't know. He probably had a dual dual nature. Now, from 1922, though he was 36 years old, growing older, a residential home, the Kempner Kemp. Kemp, Kempner House, uh, and one in Berlin, High House Eichstadt. He built a lot, that's the truth. I don't know how he built, you know, this I don't understand. How did the, these, these architects, how, how, how did they get their uh, right uh, for signature? You know, because something like this, at least in, in Romania, is not possible. I mean, you know, uh, a poor uh, architect here now he has to go six years through school and then three years of internship. So that's nine years, nine years. So if someone enters the school at 19, 
can build legally only at 28. Well, by 28, Mies already covered Germany with his words. I am uh, exaggerating, but he built 1925, another villa, residential home, no picture, 1926, here it is. Uh, these buildings make me a little bit uneasy because they are so, you know, always so sure of themselves and so um, experimental. Anyway. Maybe architecture is not supposed to be experimental. I go a little bit quickly because we still have about 550 pictures. Uh, now, this monument dedicated to Karl Lipneck, 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 and Rosa Luxemburg. It's quite an important work, I think, for Miss van der Rohe. So let's remember from 1920, he, was, he made it the project and the building because it was built in 1926. So he was 40 years old. And look at this. This is very different from what we know of usual, you know, what he built in the United States. It's very, it's tectonics. This is a heavy building, you know, it's expressionistic. There is this side in 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 Mies, you know, and uh, I think this this side uh, should not be uh, neglected or forgotten. In fact, I know that even Kenneth Frampton thought that some of the early works by by Mies could have announced a different kind of architecture, a different kind of architect than the one he became in the United States. So he was 40 years old when he built this monument for um, Karl and Rosa Luxembourg. Uh, a good work, a very good work. Apartment, apartment, a block of flats, multi-family residential in Berlin, 1927. Um, 1927 in Berlin. An interesting work, actually, you know, with its uh, stark uh, symmetry. Um, it's possible that uh, both uh, Le, uh, Adolf Loos and Le Corbusier would have liked it. Now we arrive at another very important work. Uh, this is the Weissenhof estate or the Weissenhof colony from 1927, so he was uh, 41 years old when he was uh, asked to coordinate this international exhibition uh, with uh, experimental uh, buildings in Stuttgart. And Le Corbusier took part uh, uh, with other architects like Hans Scharun, uh, I think Hugo Herring as well. Mies built a block of flats and he Mies also did um, the site plan, the, you know, the so-called master plan for this colony of, um, of uh, you know, uh, buildings, uh, you know, houses and, uh, you know, having to do with uh, habitation, with housing by very important architects of that time, 1927. So all this uh, campus, all this colony, as it is called, the Weissenhof colony, was uh, designed under the, you know, in a way, the leadership of, of Mies, who did the, the, the site plan and uh, also built a, a block of flats, which is this one. Um, Le Corbusier also built a larger building here. I hope I have it. Here is the plan of the, of the building by Mies. You see, he changed. He changed rather rapidly. Well, yeah, in a way, rather rapidly in a, in, in, in a short number of, uh, of years, he uh, became free from the nostalgic, uh, you know, uh, aspects of, uh, of his residential architecture and became, uh, you know, resolutely modern. Um, like here, we don't see, we don't have a, sloping roofs or anything like this. It's, it's a different kind of architecture. Uh, 
I wish I had more pictures with Weiss and Hoff, but we, we still have a lot of other things, to, many other things to show. 1928, uh, another home. Uh, this one also is interesting because it shows, it shows how Mies is uh, while still, because here we have brick and it's a brick architecture, but it's, he is moving, uh, he's clearly uh, moving, making steps towards that Mies that we know of. Without in this particular project um, uh, distancing himself from what we call a, a solid wall, but does this building look like a house? Well, you know we could debate. Of course, it's a big house, but it could have been a kindergarten or even a small school, a uh, small office building. Uh, it has, I think, in the tension between the private and the public. Uh, here, the public or the publicness of the building is still rather um, emphatic. It's a good building. Yes, it's a good building. It's possible that now it's an art gallery there. I see something there. It's not a house. Uh, uh, it's very important to, 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 to reflect on what a home is, what a house is. Uh, because in the, I mean, in, in, in the case of this, this, this project, this building, uh, I think the level of intimacy, I mean, would you, would you call, would you, would you see the hearth, the hearth in this building? Well, with some difficulty, perhaps. But on the other hand, it, it, it is freeing you, or it, it, yes, it is freeing you from the expectations relating to nostalgia, maybe uh, an excessive sweetness, that sweetness that made Adolf Loos say, people love their home and hate art. Here, Mies tries to distance himself as much as possible from that sweetness. And I think that sweetness existed in him because we saw some of the buildings that he built when he was younger. There was a certain sweetness, questionable sweetness in his uh, initial uh, architecture, but he's here more and more removed from it. In fact, almost completely. I like this building, but again, is it a home? Is it a house? It was initially, but um, I mean, the program was for a house, but Anyway, a different conception about what a house is or could be or should be. It's an excellent building, yes. And a little bit different from what he did in the States because what he did in the States, he was uh, perfecting a, an aesthetical system uh, almost obsessionally. And he forgot these earlier buildings. I mean, he was already 41 years old or something like this when he built, so he was not a teenager any longer. But uh, he moved away. When he moved to the United States, he, uh, he kind of uh, turned his back on uh, a certain uh, viscerality of the materials he used, the tectonics that here we still, uh, we still, uh, there is a certain heaviness here, despite the very large windows. Uh, you know, for that time they were rather large. Now we arrive in 1929, the, Bar the well-known Barcelona Pavilion, uh, the World's Fair uh, Pavilion, the World's Fair uh, Pavilion, the World's Fair in Barcelona. Uh, so he was uh, 43 years old. Miss van der Rohe was 43 when he built the Barcelona Pavilion. Uh, it was destroyed, as you probably know, and it was rebuilt by the, by the Catalans. Uh, I don't know exactly when, but uh, probably after he died. Um, funny about this building, because we think that Miss van der Rohe was against uh, ornamentation. Well, look at, look at these marble the walls here, you know. They are some of the most uh, decorated walls in modernity. I mean, decorated with a, with a beautiful uh, or natural ornaments of marble. Uh, 
uh, uh, you can see them here too. So would you say that the modernist Smith was against ornament, but uh, these walls are, uh, you know, um, covered by ornaments, natural ornaments, natural ornaments. Of course, like in the case of Adolos, who even wrote violently against the ornament in architecture, but he also employed uh, very richly ornamented uh, marbles. Uh, this building also is an expensive building, uh, you know, uh, most of his works are actually, uh, you know, expensive works of art, and they are works of art. The Barcelona chair, um, which he probably designed with Lily Reich, and uh, if I remember correctly, I think she, her input here was not just in terms of designing the furniture or some pieces of furniture, but also the pavilion. Lily Reich, a very interesting lady, uh, I don't know what this is with the with the and the energy fields or something in the in the in the Barcelona pavilion. I look again at this. So again, who says that uh, Miss is against ornament should look again at his work because it's simply not true. I mean, this wall is covered with ornaments from bottom to top and from left to right. It in itself is an ornamental world. This one another, the same. Okay, so this is from 1929. Villa Savoie was built in 1928. Villa Savoie, of course, by Le Corbusier. He was a dreamer. He was a he was an artist too. Miss was. You have to be. I just read in Arch Daily yesterday. I think that uh, Francis Carey said that uh, art is uh, architecture is much more than art and uh, more than uh, building. Well. <laughs> I, I try to formulate my thought about it. it. It is through art that the building becomes architecture. And I wouldn't say, I, I, I would actually say that architecture, that, that uh, uh, yes, architecture at its best is art. So qualitatively, I think one should not say something like this, that architecture is much more than art. How could it be? much more than what is actually its ideal state. I guess what he wanted to say is that architecture has other aspects to it. And it's true, architecture is a little different from art because it is a usable art. Uh, there are many aspects relating to architecture, but I would never say that it's much more than art. I would say it has other concerns and other aspects that it needs to address and at its best, it becomes art. Uh, and it is then when the building becomes architecture. Otherwise, a building is just that, a building. And I think Paul Valéry was correct when he said, and I mentioned this before, and I hate to repeat, but uh, I repeat it, that there are three kinds of builders. One who places a stone above another stone, it's a builder, he is a builder than the one who places a stone above another stone and makes them talk. He's a master builder. And the third one places a stone above another stone and makes them sing. And his name is Eupalinos or the architect. But to make the stone sing, you have to be an artist, a musician, a composer. Otherwise, you cannot make the stone sing. Okay, 1932, the Lemke House uh, is moving uh, courageously. Uh, he was already at this time directing uh, the Bauhaus. He was replacing Hans Meyer. The Bauhaus had, had three directors, Walter Gropius, Hans, Hans Meyer, 
and then Miss van der Rohe, the last one. So Miss, Miss was from 1930 to 1933, the director of the very famous school. I, I like this building because, exactly because, you know, you know it's a residence, you know it's a house, but it doesn't quite look like a house. I mean, here you see clearly it's a it's a it's a house, you know, with many uh, with a number of apartments. It's clear it's residential function, but here it's not so clear. You know, I almost tempted to speculate now linguistically, linguistically that the best the best in life is when you arrive at a state which is not quite what it seems to be. I don't know if I expressed well. Is the otherness of anything that, or, or a certain doubleness. It is and it isn't. You know, and now I'm thinking of my name because I don't identify with my name at all. I, I keep signing with Dan Coma, but, but I, I, I don't identify with this name and it's not even my name because my first name is Yuan, not Dan, but maybe this very uncomfortableness because it is uncomfortable to sign with a name that, that doesn't quite represent you and I, 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 and I don't feel represented by this name. Uh, I keep it like this, although I thought many times of changing it and I did change it uh, once in the States for a few years. I, I just call myself plus minus ion. But coming back to the building by, uh, by Miss, you look at this building and you say, no, this is not a home. It's not a house. Could be again, a small kindergarten or uh, some kind of an office. He's right at the frontier between, between being a house or a residential build, building and being something else. Is this otherness, which is intriguing, you know? Uh, um, and maybe this is true in many arts when you create something which is uh, unsettling, uh, you know, for the viewer, you, you don't quite know, you know, it, it is what it claims it is, or it's something else. There is, uh, I, I like these two words, abysmal inquietude, you know, or, or nelinishte abisala. Uh, maybe I push too far now, but when I look at this, this structure, you know, if we didn't know it was a home, I, I don't know if too many people would have thought this is a home. Look at this. A home doesn't have this kind of, uh, even today, I think it would, uh, it would be actually an interesting exercise to send this image out and ask architects and students in architecture, what do you think the function of this building is? Now, of course, you look now through the glass and you see it looks like an art gallery because that's what it is now. But initially it was a home, a house, a residence. Does it look like a residence? Not quite. With this one, there is no ambiguity. Now this one is clear. Yes, it's not just a single residence, but uh, it's clear. This is a residential building. But this one, no. Not quite. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that um, uh, Miss was searching for an architecture which exactly when it was approaching uh, um, was exhausting the, the destination was trying to arrive at exactly then it, he, he, he almost stepped outside of the destination. So thus he obtained that otherness that I'm, 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 I'm attempting desperately to, to try to define. Anyway, a project for a country house. Now it's a project, but here we see Mies at his uh, most mission, so to speak. You see clearly, he was a man of vision. You know, this project, this drawing sh shows it. You know, it, 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 we don't see any dimensions here. It's, it's, it's the, the formal aspects of the buildings are, of the building are, uh, um, 
you know, almost uh, quintessential. Although he very correctly was against uh, was against formalism in art in architecture, and I think he was not. I I wouldn't call him a formalist. Now now look at his look at look at his evolution. You know, from that house which we saw, and where he arrived with the Barcelona Pavilion here, the together together house house uh, in. Um, it's it's quite a journey, is it not? From here to here. Uh, what is this? A factory. I like these lesser works by by lesser known works by by Mills. In fact, I I I am fascinated by 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 what is less known by what is uh, in the shadow, so to speak. You know, less famous works, but. I think uh, they 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 stir up my imagination more. Now Villa Tugendhat, which is a very important work by him, and it even became a World Heritage Site by UNESCO in 2001, is from 1930. He was 44 years old when he um, when he built it. It's a it's an you know an opulent uh, modern statement here. It's, it's 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 a very good building indeed. And uh, what can we say? This one, this one, yes. When you look at it, you would say this is a this is a residential building. Although even here there is a dangerous um, um, vicinity or uh, with with uh, with the publicness of a public life or public life on public building, while it is a private building. I mean, it was built as a residence. So this is in Bruno, and there was a chair designed here that apparently Lily Reich designed, and we are going to see it. Now here, we, we could almost say that he, he indulged in uh, inviting the impurity, I, I know I, I express myself uh, controversially, the impurity of, of, of curve, usually the curve brings in purity, but because his system is rather rectangular, when he employs a curvature, uh, that becomes like a nuisance in a way. The Tugend had a house in Brno. UNESCO World Heritage. There are all kinds of books, all kinds of published, uh, you know, uh, it's a very rigorously built uh, building. He was, he was, he was an architect, but he was also a builder. He was both. You cannot be a good architect if you are not a builder. But you can be a builder without being an architect. He was both. He, he, he plus he had the rigor of uh, you know of Germany in him. Now the Barcelona Pavilion. Uh, I don't know why I show it here from 1929. Maybe to compare it with the with the building in Bruno. Now so from 1929 he left actually Germany in 1933 or early 1934. That's when Miss. And well, the, the Bauhaus was uh, ceased its activities, and uh, he moved to the States. He moved to Chicago, where also Laszlo Moholinogi moved, and other other Bauhaus, uh, you know, uh, uh, former students, teachers, and so on in Chicago. Um, uh, Laszlo Mokolinogi uh, started the new Bauhaus in Chicago, but Miss was not involved with the new Bauhaus. 
he became, um, you know, the the main architecture force be, behind I, ITT, the Illinois Institute of Technology. I don't know how it was called at that time, but um, let's look at his works in the in the United States. What's important again is that until 1933, 1934, Miss lived and worked in Europe, in Germany. He left for the United States when other people left too because of the rising nationalism of the fascists and the Nazism, uh, and, and, and he left. Uh, left, uh, some of them, uh, of the Bauhaus people went to Switzerland, some to Great Britain, and then later to the States, uh, like Walter Gropius and Marcel Breuer, but Miss went to Chicago. So 1939, 1958, the Illinois Institute of Technology campus master. He made this, uh, you know, he, he loved to do master, master plans. Uh, he did one uh, for Weissenhof. He did this one for um, the Illinois Institute of Technology, uh, the campus master plan. So 1939, he built many buildings here. So from 1939 to 1958, of course, there was the period during the world, the Second World War, when I don't know if they built much then, and I don't know what he did during those years. Anyway, this is what he did. You know, it's um, he was searching. He was searching for order. You know, uh, in in with his own vision, his own interpretation of order. Uh, and it was an order which had to have, I, 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 I mentioned this before, that the word order in Greek means cosmos. No, the other way around, cosmos means order. So there is a, but I wouldn't play with these words because it's, it could sound a little bit um, emphatic or rhetorical or demagogical. But when I look at even at this model, you know, it's, I truly think he was searching for the immeasurable, for the ineffable of, of the art of building. I see a certain purity here. It's, it's not just, you know, it's not that rigidity of the, of the strict rationalist. No, I, I, I wouldn't say so. But he was a poet and Frank Lloyd Wright was correct. A great architect is a, is a poet, not in the sense that he writes poems per se with words, but writes poetry through buildings, through using materials, bricks, stone, glass, metal, and so on. Here is a view of, his, uh, of what became of his uh, site plan. Here is a building of his adversary, in a way, Rem Kolhas, this station, this is a students, and I had been here, I visited it, um, and I think this is the crown hall, truly a masterpiece, a crown building by, uh, uh, in, in the oeuvre of, uh, or is this one? No, this one I think is the crown hall. Anyway, uh, I guess all these buildings were built by Mies. Uh And, you know, later on, uh, you know, Lam Kolhas came in, in fact, today I received, because I, I launched that uh, call for entries, uh, a lousy uh, house uh, for lousy van der Rohe, and a friend of mine from the States, an architect, sent me already an image of this building by uh, Rem Kolhas, by the way of uh, you know, lousy van der Rohe. Now, the promontory apartments from 1949, uh, excellent buildings. You know, that, I mean, again, I like this building because it, it almost looks like an industrial building, a vertical industrial building. You, you wouldn't quite say it's residential, you know? I mean, it could be, but you are not very sure, or I'm not very sure because it's the, here I don't have any, any uh, doubt. It's a residential block of flats. It's a block of flats, but here again, I think he's in between. The in betweenness of architecture is shown in his work, um, at least in, 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 in some cases. It is and it isn't. 
And it is exactly this, uh, the uneasiness of being in between that uh, makes his work uh, great. Now, look, uh, there are subtleties here. You look at the structure, you look at the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the shadow. You know, the, the, the shadow is uh, decreasing towards the top and it's increasing towards the bottom. So this is giving you a, so a subtle uh, um, feeling about the, you know, the static aspects of the structure which are legitimate in this case. Now the interior is as it is, you know. Uh, of course, you could smile uh, even ironically because, you know, you see this, uh, you know, in a way the disorder of life is parking for bikes or whatever, motorcycles. And then you have these huge surfaces of glass, you know, uh, I don't know. I mean, this is the lobby of the building, but it's still, uh, you know, this these large pieces of glass seem to be a little bit uh, uh, irritated or irritable uh, because of what's going on outside. If it was, a, I don't know, a lake or a beautiful landscape, probably it would have been better, but it's, it's possible this was not because of his poor design. I really like this building, you know, uh, with its um, you know, austerity and, uh, and yet it's not, I don't think it's a cold building. I wouldn't call it a cold building. No, I, I like it very much. And in fact, I regret I don't have more pictures with it. Another apartment building from 1951. At a superficial reading, you would say, well, what's so special about this building? I regret I don't I don't myself did I didn't myself study them carefully enough to be able to to verbalize in what sense they are you know legitimate buildings by uh, Miss van der Rohe. Now these are more famous the Lakeshore Drive apartments from 1951. So 70 years ago or so. Why did I say that Miss van der Rohe destroyed Chicago? Because, well, he's a, he, with his strong personality, he modified the architecture of Chicago. There were uh, insinuations for some kind of um, you know, rational office uh, kind of architecture uh, with different modernists in, uh, in, in Chicago previously, but, I think what was forgotten was the romantic architecture of Louis Sullivan and Frank Lloyd Wright. I'm not saying that Miss was not a romantic soul. I think he was, but in a very different way than, me, than Sullivan and, 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 uh, and, uh, and Wright. If you compare this building with uh, buildings by uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, you understand immediately that it's, it's a big difference. They are good buildings and actually uh, Chicago and its neighborhoods does have a valuable, uh, you know, uh, architecture kind of inspired by, by Mies. I, I'm still a little bit uh, unsure if this is truly the, the, the genuine architecture uh, for uh, Midwest, for uh, mid America. I am not so sure, but they are exquisite, uh, these buildings, these prisms. In, in essence, it's about proportions. Just like in the case of Palladio, it's about proportions. They are perfectly calibrated in terms of proportion. Now, these are, this is architecture. It's the Lake Drive Shore building by, by Mies. Is this equally architecture? I would say less so. So here we have a building and here we have architecture. How we verbalize about the difference. Uh, here in the back is the Hancock Tower built by uh, Skidmore Owings and Merrill. 
But still, you look look at these priests by by me. They are they are impeccable. You know, they have dignity. They have they have poetry. They they have this immeasurableness, which which makes the genuine poetry of architecture, uh, you know, a manifest. Uh, there are plenty of buildings here, but these two still stand out like kind of you know two jewels, I would say. I think the more I make presentations about these important architects, the more I feel tempted to move beyond my own uh, limits and to, for example, in this case, I, I feel like analyzing more uh, uh, the building and to, to try to explain myself, why is it that I consider this architecture and this one less so? You know, whoa, 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 whoa. what is the mystery of this building? Because it seems to be, you know, quite, uh, uh, you know, plain in a way. I think it has to do a lot with, with proportions. Here he is uh, at the top of the building, of the building. Uh, uh, it's an older man, um, probably not a very happy man. I, I think I think he had, a, and I don't know if he was ill or not. Anyway, um, in that picture, that is very elegant. It's true, almost inhumanly elegant. Another residential uh, complex, 1951. These. Like them too, actually, you know, in their simplicity and uh, but in their simplicity, the apparent simplicity. I don't know if things were changed here. I see the the height of the windows differs. Could it be that he made them like this? I don't know. I, I don't know enough. I, I'm not a, I'm not an expert really. I, I just am intrigued by uh, by the professional journey of uh, such uh, such architects as he as he was, and as he is still is. I mean, I am asking myself: if I didn't know it was by me, would I have stopped? Would I have would I would I have said uh, this is architecture? Um, now we arrive at a very famous building by him, one of the most famous, of course, besides the Barcelona Pavilion, the Farnsworth House, designed for a lady uh, with whom he had some kind of a relationship. Uh, he was a seducer, probably, and uh, women found him uh, very, uh, you know, hypnotizing. So uh, this doctor who commissioned this house, she even accepted, you know, the risks of, uh, you know, investing in, in an expensive building uh, that was uh, flooded, uh, you know, rather frequently, as you can see here. Uh, now, of course, we cannot uh, blame uh, Miss for the flood. But uh, maybe we can uh, blame him a little bit for the fact that sometimes the floods went inside the building. That is, he didn't elevate the building sufficiently from the earth. Uh, this is from underneath the building, you know, and uh, this, this is uh, not... Uh, I, I wouldn't like to be the person to clean up uh, what is underneath the building. Uh, you know, and here it's also impossible, you know, while uh, here maybe it's, it's possible to go underneath, but what do you do here? Yes, it's very elegant, of course, this platform that um, almost floats above the earth, but uh, <laughs> he was obviously not a functionalist, because a functionalist would do something, wouldn't do something like this. A functionalist would say, well, if dirt accumulates underneath this, how are we going to take it out? He didn't think of such matters. Why? Because he was a poet. That's why. 
I mean, you know, it's almost amusing, you know, the level of blindness in a way to function of so many important architects. I don't know if you know the story, but uh, one, uh, one night, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright was called by uh, Mr. Kaufman, the inhabitant and, and beneficiary of the falling water building, uh, telling him uh, in this great distress, Frank, it's, it's raining in the living room of the masterpiece, the falling water. And uh, Frank uh, replied to him, come on, uh, Edgar, you don't have a pot. So there, you know, the, the, archi the, the poet architect or the architect poet, uh, you know, doesn't, uh, it's not very moved by, uh, you know, functional uh, things, not very often now. Anyway, look here, water, 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 of course it's nice, but uh, sometimes water got into the building. Look right here. <laughs> You know, look at those uh, curtains, you know, uh, being, uh, you know, uh, brought upwards uh, to not be attacked by uh, the, the invading water. Uh, here, the building is uh, clearly taking, uh, is being, uh, uh, you know, uh, under the threat of uh, almost disappearing soon because of the flood. Now, to my shame, I have to say uh, that uh, although I lived in Chicago for more than five years, uh, I, I never went to visit this building. Once I wanted to go and exactly then it was flooded and it was closed. And the person who invited me, who told me that, uh, who was ready to, to bring me there, uh, regretted he couldn't because of the flood. So I, I never I, I never visited it, but uh, what can you do? There are so many great buildings in the in the world, and uh, uh, it's it's almost impossible to see all of them. I love this picture. It's true. It's um, yes, it's poetry. Yes, it is man and nature, the genius of nature and the genius of man, because Miss did have did have genius. This, 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 this building is, uh, is almost, uh, in a way, it's an anti-house because, because it became art. And uh, if we remember what Adolf Loh said, that man loves home or the house and hates art. Well, this we love because it is art. And uh, Maybe, you know, such buildings are not meant to live in. They are just meant to look at. I wonder how the doctor felt here. Uh, if she was in love with me, I guess she would have accepted anything from me, from him. The furniture, so by him, of course, um, I don't know who these people are. Anyway, some visitors. But you see, even the purest poetry in architecture, even the purest statements are under the siege. You know, they are, you see here the rust because the metal is metal. You know, uh, rust is slowly attacking the metal parts. And uh, what can you do about it? If, yes, you can, it needs maintenance. But uh, you see again, the purity of architecture is uh, temporary and uh, it needs uh, adjustments because the elements are not very sensitive and the passage of time. Here is the doctor. The doctor who commissioned the building from Miss, maybe she's thinking of Miss in this picture, maybe Miss himself took this picture, I don't know. Anyway, love is more important than the most building, that's for sure. This is art, 
Now, maybe it's a little bit rhetorical, you know, this purity between the trees, because it is pure, but maybe it's too pure. If we can say something, so, uh, yeah. Here is the, you know, the, the man with the boat, you know, because a lot of people work in order to protect the, um, you see a lot of pieces, uh, things are on the counter of the kitchen. Why? Because, you know, uh, they expected the level of the, of the flooding to increase and, uh, you know, to get inside the building as this happened in the past. So maybe, I mean, I, I, I know it's very questionable what I'm trying to say, but if he didn't build such a pure building, maybe the flooding would not have been so severe. I think here the flood is, I mean, nature unconsciously is probably trying to, you know, uh, take over the purity of architectural poetry. And uh, I don't know, I mean, I feel tempted to say some uh, foolish things now because I'm not against purity, but um, I think true life is a mixture between purity and impurity is uh, when you make such a statement, you know, so ethereal, so, you know, life laughs at you, you know, a sardonical. Even the drawing is beautiful. Look at this drawing. This is poetry. It's graphic poetry. And it's, you know, it's just, uh, you know, sections through the building. Ah. Now the Crown Hall, another great building by him in, on the Illinois Institute of Technology campus. I was invited once to be in a, in a jury uh, to look at projects by students here and I did go. And um, you know, it's a huge space where students from various years work together. There are no separations, you know, there, there are no rooms, no rooms on a corridor. No, it's a, it's a large, communal space. Uh, what I remember the most, um, uh, you know, the, the, well, the most memorable moment for me was when, when I left the building and I turned my head to take another look at the facade of the building. And it was the, I so regret I didn't have a camera with me because it was sunset. And the way the sunlight touched the the entrance platform was magical. I had a feeling, and I'm not exaggerating, I'm not lying, and I'm not uh, fantasizing. I had the feeling that that platform, and we are going to, to see it actually, I hope, uh, was like an altar. It was something almost religious. Um, anyway, it, it's here, it's this platform. So when I left, and I turned my head, the way the sun touched this, the, or I don't know, may, may, of course I was so subjective, but it was something magical, really. I had a feeling that this platform here, between these two flights upstairs, was some kind of an altar, you know, uh, sacrificial or otherwise. The light animated the, the platform in a, in, a, in a magical way. Is is another perfect building by uh, by Miss. Now, maybe true perfection is imperfect. That could could be could be that might be true. We, we can talk about this, but it is it is uh, another perfect perfect building by this uh, impossible architect. He was impossible because his uh, system became so uh, perfected that. It had to be broken. It had to, that's why Ricardo Bofil said for us, meaning for him and Taller de Arquitectura, his architecture office, he said, for us, Magritte is more important than Miss.
the Crown Hall, IIT, Chicago. But when I look at the ceiling in this picture and maybe in other pictures, I'm not so happy with what I see because somehow the ceiling, at least what I see in this picture is uh, less celestial than the floor, is more um, pedestrian, more banal, maybe because of the materials he used. Yeah, even here, you know, it's, I don't know, it's something, I mean, you would expect that the, the floor, the surface you walk on is a little bit um, hierarchically speaking and in qualitative uh, terms speaking, a little bit inferior to the ceiling because the ceiling is uh, closer to the sky. If this doesn't sound too, too romantic or too, I don't know, uh, idealistic. But here, the floor seems to be more refined because of the materials he used than the ceiling. I, uh, I feel tempted to, to think so. Otherwise, the building is perfect. Yes, it's, it doesn't matter. You look at it at night or in the morning or in the evening. It's, um, The Crown Hall and, and the School of Architecture is here, which I forgot to say, is the Illinois Institute of Technology. And we had the chance last year to have, to have with us a professor in this very school. I don't know if she still is Ginny Gang because now she's teach it, teaching at Harvard, but she taught for a number of years and she is from Chicago, her office is in Chicago. I think she still teaches there sometimes at least. Illinois Institute of Technology, IIT. Here is the master with some students, of course, only males. At that time, there were very few ladies. Fortunately, things change. Now there are more uh, female students than male students. Do you see any lady here? Yes, there is one here. But uh, everyone else is, uh, is a boy. <laughs> Anyway, things change and it's good that they change. The Crown Hall. Now an IIT chapel, the reason I saw it is there is a chapel he built on the same campus. Interesting that for the chapel, he used, um, you know, bricks. I mean, on the sides. Not bad. Because architecture is an abstract art, it is. And uh, here the level of abstraction and refinement is, is, is high. There is austerity, but there is also, uh, it's not a crushing austerity, it's a, it's a gentle austerity, if I am to call it so. He truly combined united uh, l'esprit de geometrie with l'esprit de finesse the spirit of geometry with the spirit of um, fineness. In its silence, this building does tell you, I'm a sacred building, I'm a chapel. Now, this is the building by, uh, well, there are two buildings. Is this one and the subway station by Rem Kolhas. So if you want to visit the IIT um, campus, you get off of the subway station. This was built by uh, Rem Kolhas. So this is a student center by Rem Kolhas. And this is the subway station. And he, you know, encircled it like this, you know, for uh, noise uh, reasons. Um, it's not bad, but um, there is a little bit of the cynicism of uh, uh, Rem Kolhas because 
you know, this, uh, the rail and the station kind of uh, squeezes and crashes onto the, you know, the, the building. It's, um, I don't know, it's, it's the meanings to me seems to be a little bit problematic of what he did, but uh, it's, it's, not, it's not a bad building by Byron Corfas. Now, Chicago Federal Building, he built many, my God, my God. I mean, you know, too many in a way, I would say, too many buildings. It's a federal building, a governmental building. This is a... Uh, no, it has a, you know, almost say, you know, it could be, it could be almost some kind of a sacred space. But why, and I said this last year and I say it again, I will say it probably next year again. You know, it's so uplifting to see a sculpture by Alexander Calder here with color and different forms you know, because at one moment you get tired of so much perfection with right angles and, uh, you know, uh, straight lines and so on. So the disturbance of art is needed. You know, it's, it's like, welcome back to life. You know, uh, bravo Alexander Calder, who was actually an engineer, uh, but a brilliant uh, sculptor. Uh, here he is again, Alexander Calder the otherness of art. And yes, the, the subtle uh, perfectionism of miss. Lakeshore Drive Apartments, we already talked about them. We saw this picture. Why do I show? Here is the plan. Luxurious apartments, of course. These are not for proletarians. Now we arrive at another masterpiece by Miss, although officially the, the project was not done by him, but by Philip Johnson, because Miss didn't have the right for signature in New York City in 1954. So Philip Johnson signed the, the drawings, but the project belongs, of course, to, uh, to Miss. Uh, and it's a, it, it's, um, it, it's, it's a very good building. It's very elegant, aristocratic. Maybe, maybe the client was less aristocratic, but uh, what can you do? You know, the, you might design a, a masterpiece for someone who well, it's maybe less of a masterpiece, but has the money to build it. The Seagram building. When was it built? 1954-1958. One of the most famous uh, skyscrapers in New York is actually not so tall, but um, the level of refinement is, is uh, very, very high. I once did a project, I was 20 something, 25 years old, maybe less. Uh, I made it, I, I, I proposed a meditation chapel in front of the Seagram building right here. Unfortunately, I sent, I, I might have a photograph of the project. I, I sent it to Japan. Um, maybe one day I will tell you about that project. Uh, I was in Romania when I did it, uh, imagining how it, it would have been there in front of the Seagram building. And I, I, anyway, I did foolish things because I, I, I projected on this, on the facade of the Seagram building, an image of the he devil by uh, a graphic image of uh, Max Stans. I guess I, I was an anti-capitalist uh, at that early age. Uh, 
and even the function of the chapel, uh, you know, a meditation chapel, this is not really where you place a meditation chapel, which didn't have wind doors. Everyone could have used it. Um, it was my war with, um, with the mercantilism of capitalism in the name of spirit. So right here. Anyway, I, I, I could sketch, um, I could sketch, I remember what I did, but the project I don't have because I sent it to Japan. Uh, I do have a photograph somewhere, I, if I didn't lose it. Look at it, it's perfect, it really is. And look at the elevation, everything is perfect. The plan, this plan, you know, the plaza, the facade, everything is impeccable, truly. Less impeccable probably was the price at the Four Seasons uh, restaurant here, which uh, I mean, we are talking here about uh, you know very expensive, uh, you know, uh, place. Berlin National Gallery of Art, another important building by him in Berlin. So he returned to Europe, he returned to Germany to build this building. I don't know if he built something else, but he built this uh, National Gallery in uh, in uh, in berlin which was recent, recently um, restored i forgot uh, what architect an important architect in the present uh, restored it it's a fine building I have seen this sculpture also in front of the Mark Rothko Chapel in the, in the United States, uh, designed by Philip Johnson. Maybe it's a version of this uh, sculpture. I don't know who the sculptor is. So this is the, the National Gallery uh, of Art um, in Berlin by Mies. Here on the left, you see a building by Renzo Piano built later, of course, uh, an installation within the building. Furniture design, <laughs> I have another section with furniture design. This is like an intermezzo, a few designs of furniture by, by, uh, by Mies. As I said, he didn't quite create them alone. He created them with, uh, with uh, Lili Reich and it's possible Lili Reich actually had a more important role than is usually acknowledged. Uh, here is a little picture, you can see it very well. It's Miss on the right with the little artworks by uh, Paul Klee on the walls. And on the right is Rem Kolhas. Miss again in his apartment in uh, Chicago. Now here he is with, um, you know, probably talking about the project for uh, the Seagram building. Philip Johnson on the left. Uh, Miss van der Rohe, and uh, this is uh, the client actually, a uh, remarkable lady. Um, what is her name? Uh, what a shame, I'm getting old, I'm beginning to forget. Um, she's still alive and she runs the Canadian uh, Center for Architecture, uh, great uh, lover of architecture. Um, and she commissioned, uh, the, this was a building built for her father or the company of her father, Lombard, Lombard her name, but I forgot now her first name. I'm obviously get, getting old. So here is uh, Miss, uh, always elegant, even in his own house, uh, and uh, with the artworks by uh, Paul Klee on the walls. Interesting, the, the walls, because these are not the walls of modernity. And this, is his, this was his apartment in, uh, 
in Chicago. Very, very different from my own apartment and my own rooms because I have an incredible clutter and disorder and it's just incredible. You would say that this man is moving out. That's why it is like this. It's, I don't, I don't know how someone could live like this. You know, it's, you don't see a sock here or something. Nothing. Everything is, is, is perfect. You know, uh, almost uh, irritatingly so. How could? He? But, but then he needed the art of Paul Klee on the walls. Why? Because that side, he didn't address. So we, anyway, uh, let's move forward. The Barcelona couch with black straps. Yes, he designed them, but uh, I think he designed them with, uh, or maybe she designed them with his help. Um, now, we'll, 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 I have to arrive quickly at uh, Lili Reich because it's important to mention her, uh, to say a few words about her. Because they, 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 they were together for 13 years. 13 years is not a short time. This is his grave uh, stone, uh, you know, Ludwig Miss van der Rohe, 1886-1969. Now I accelerate a little bit because we still have some works to see by him. Um, this was just, an, I don't know exactly why I created this intermezzo. Uh, Another home by him in the States from 1952. Quite large, as you can see. I don't think he placed it. I mean, these furnitures had been moved. It doesn't look like this is going to the plan. I mean, respecting the plan, maybe here more. McCormick, McCormick House. I think that uh, student center uh, that Rem has built in the, in the, in the IIT, uh, uh, campus uh, has this name, McCormick. I don't know, I should know who this McCormick was, probably someone very important. I see, you know, even his house was designed by, uh, now some magical, some magical, uh, you know, uh, things are happening here. I, I forgot that this is, uh, anyway. The PowerPoint is uh, quite appealing, you know, as a look, 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 look what, what, what happens here. Things become uh, uh, animated all of a sudden. Not bad. Anyway, let's move forward. So this is the house for my karmic, my karmic Museum of Fire, I don't know if I have pictures here. I have one and I think the plan is somewhere else a little bit later. Here I, I got a little bit uh, less rigorous about my presentation. The Museum of Fine Arts in Houston, Texas. Mm, I, I don't find it so remarkable, this building for some reason. Not everything he built uh, is or was a masterpiece, you know, it's uh, inevitable, you know, not, not, not all buildings and not all paintings and not all sculptures of anyone are all, you know, with the same level of excellence. Some are better, some are less good, uh, it's inevitable. Home Federal Savings and Loan Association building 1959. My God, see, he built so many of these, you know, it's just, uh, it, it can be tiring, actually. I am glad, actually, that there is such a building here, you know, because he, there was one like this one also here. I, 
you need the, you need the old buildings too. The Lafayette Park residential development in Detroit. This is an interesting project though, in Detroit. I, I like I like what I see. You know, you have uh, nature, and then you have the you know, the purity of architecture, very well, uh, very convincingly uh, arrived at. So this is in Detroit. I'm not the, you know, at Lafayette Park, Van der Rohe creates a dramatic dialogue between architecture and nature. I don't know who wrote this, maybe the photographer. He built several buildings here. But the sad thing is that actually Detroit is, uh, you know, a place of, uh, at least now, you know, uh, the purity of Miss Van der Rohe is in opposition with what, what is going on in that city because of the economic collapse. So when you look at these pictures, you would say, wow, you know, it's, it's paradise on earth, but it's actually not. I mean, the architecture has a level, a high level of purity, but uh, many things they are not like this in, in Detroit any longer. Maybe they were at one point now, but even then, because it was, uh, you know, uh, wild capitalism in a way, production of cars, 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 and again, cars and make money, 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 and money again. 1960, a pavilion and colonnade apartments, now this presentation is too long, it's much too long. Um, sorry about this, I have to shorten it. Late career worldwide. So we look from 1961 to 1969 when he died. So in eight years, let's see only uh, some buildings. We build much more than this. The Bacardi office, 1961 in Mexico City. Is it very different from what we saw earlier? not so different, you, you say immediately, this is miss, and indeed it is miss, maybe too much so. He arrived at a system, you know, a system which, uh, like any system, has its limits, because uh, it becomes, uh, it could become even oppressive. So this is in Mexico City. Now this is in Montreal, uh, residential apartment complex. I'm not very, very moved. I, I recognize, I, I wish uh, he was able to surprise me, but not here, not with such buildings. Uh, one Charles Center office tower in Baltimore, Maryland. There are so many buildings like this, you know, built by other architects and by himself that it's, it's hard to differentiate between them. North American architecture, but it's too much, it's too much of, it's too, too much sameness, actually. This one we saw already, no, but it's a different one, right? The North Lake, yeah, not sure, not sure drive. It's a different uh, apartment uh, building from 1963. I don't know what that, 2000, no, that's the number of the street, 1963. No, no, I, 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 I'm losing patience. It's, it's just too much miss, I'm sorry. Um, uh, another house from 1963, kind of the same architecture. I don't know, he, he didn't get tired of this. I guess he didn't. Because there is no exuberance, really, that exuberance that Frank Lloyd Wright equated with creativity. 
Right, said creativity equals exuberance. Well, here you don't see exuberance any longer. Maybe, and I don't know. Well, we see the exuberance in the sculpture of uh, Alexander Calder, but not in the buildings by, uh, it's just too much sameness, too much system, too much. Uh, you know, when you see a purple or uh, orange or whatever, you know, even here, which is, you know, a maintenance uh, vehicle, you, you feel that life is coming back. Yes, it's coming back because you need difference. Difference. Uh, the difference is given by Calder, by the sculptor, not by uh, not by the architect. The, ar the architect becomes, I'm sorry, monotonous with that that deadly uh, sameness. Uh, rental apartments. Look at it. You know, it's. It could have been an office building, you know, but it's actually a residential building. I'm beginning to be tired a little bit of this. I, I like more his earlier works, this late career. Maybe he was ill or maybe he was getting old or maybe he was getting tired. He didn't look like a happy man. Or maybe he felt alone, you know, I don't think he was married, you know, he had many love affairs, but no, not, not a wife. So, you know, they left him. <laughs> University of Chicago School of Social Service Administration, 96, the same thing, the same very thing. I'm tired, miss, I'm tired. I too like Magritte more than you, I'm sorry. Uh, I mean, happy birthday to you, but, but no, no, it's just too much. Uh, Pittsburgh. He's not surprising any longer. He doesn't surprise us. He doesn't. I'm sorry. Uh, once you saw the, his best buildings, <clears throat> uh, what is this? The journalism mass communication, Drake University, a good university, but the building is kind of the same, the same, the same, the same. Too much sameness. Uh, Miss, now I understand why the students didn't come to my presentation because they don't like Miss, probably, but they are wrong because he was a good architect. But anyway. Um, Montreal, another building, uh, buildings, buildings. This man wanted, like other architects, wanted to cover the earth with his works. Uh, we saw the, this building, but I don't know why this plan is here. We rem you remember, because not too many curved buildings by him, but this is, his, this is the plan of a building we saw earlier. Uh, and now Toronto, an office tower complex in Toronto, 67-69. These three, of course, they are by him, but still, I don't know. Uh, here there is some elegance, it's true, there is. This one, though, is nice. It's interesting, and he, he made it... Uh, when, when he died in 1969, the filling station. It's a, it's a, it's a gas station. It's a gas station. But uh, yeah, it's still something, you know, you didn't expect a gas station to be made like me by Miss, and uh, not in this way, but although it does look like a Miss building, but it's a gas station. It's not a museum of art, it's a gas station. One Illinois center, this was completed post-mortem because he died in 69, is this building here. Chicago. Another work completed after his death.
Uh, you can see some of, of the buildings, maybe not so few, are, you know, just typical needs, but without that uh, spark of, uh, you know, of, uh, inspirational uh, spontaneity and, and genius. Another one, uh, where is it in uh, Chicago, an office tower, IBM Plaza. Too many, too many. And yes, there is a certain elegance here. I, I confess, I, I recognize it when I see it. Buildings on the Illinois Institute of Technology. This is the site plan that he did and he built all those buildings. Um, Nineteen forty-three. I don't know what this building is doing here. Some some other buildings immediately after the war. Another prosaic. Some classrooms. Nineteen forty-six. He built a lot. He built and built and built and built. Of course, he had no time for for a family life, and for a wife and some children. He wanted to cover the earth with his buildings. Ah, no, I am sorry. My 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 uh, <laughs> my patience is uh, is is dying. But this one is interesting. From 1950, a boiler plant. IIT boiler plant. It's an industrial building, and I like it. I like it because of the the otherness of of the, its function. The boiler boiler room boiler building. We are approaching the end. Uh, Carmen Hall a dormitory. Yeah, yeah. I have to I have to shorten this presentation dramatically because it's, it's just too long. And, and, and with me, so you don't have the variety you have with other architects. You just get tired of all this, uh, you know, structuralism. Why are there so many? I'm sorry, I show myself very vulnerable in front of you, but we are approaching the end. I promise you, they, they will will end very soon. But before we end, we have to say a few words about the. Because I made a mistake here, I wanted to to pay my respect to Miss, and I took all his works, well, most of his works from the Wikipedia list, and it's just too much. I should have been more selective. Okay. We arrive again at the fire furniture designs, just a few more images and I end. Here I will talk a little bit about Lily Reich because it is important to talk about her. I mentioned her and let's read about her. Lily Reich, she was one year older than Miss, born in 1885, was a German modernist designer. She was a close collaborator with Ludwig Miss van der Rohe for more than 10 years, actually 13 years. And she died uh, in 1947, not in 1969, like, like, like him. So she died younger than him. So th through her involvement with the Werkbund, Lili Reich also met L Ludwig Miss van der Rohe. In 1926, she moved from Frankfurt to Berlin to work with Miss. She was van der Rohe's personal and professional partner for 13 years from 1925 until his emigration to the United States in 1938. So uh, 13 years, you know, they were lovers, they were partners, they were together. It is said that they were constant companions working together on curating and implementing exhibitions for the Werkbund, as well as designing modern, modern furniture as part of larger architectural commissions, such as the Barcelona Pavilion in 1929, and the Tugendhat house in uh, Brno. Two of the best known mod modern furniture designs from this period are the Barcelona chair and the Brno chair. And now we look at them. The Brno chair is here. Uh, she had an input here. Maybe she even designed it alone. I don't know. It is signed by them both. 
So this is the Bruno chair. And then you will see the Barcelona chair. Uh, here it is, the famous Barcelona chair. But I read also, I think she had an input also within the pavilion itself, the meaning the Barcelona, the Barcelona pavilion. We saw these pieces of furniture by Miss Erha, and I read actually that he had the, the, the most uh, success in the field of furniture design when they were together. After they broke up, uh, Miss didn't produce any important piece of furniture, so apparently her, her uh, importance uh, in, in this part of his oeuvre was very high. And it's also possible in other respects, but it's very common, unfortunately, that the women in the life of some architects, uh, like in the wives, the two wives of Alvaro Alto, the, 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 the impact on, 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 on them and on, on, on him and, and, and his works, their works is high, but it's not known because this aspect of, you know, the, the activity of the women architects, at least during that time was not so um, of interest to critics and so on. But Lily Reich should be remembered. On this day of, of, of the birthday of Miss van der Rohe, we should also remember this, uh, this lady who spent 13 years of her life together with, with Miss, working together, creating together, and so on. So happy birthday, Miss, and thank you for uh, being patient with me today. <laughs>